I don't care where I have to drive. I don't care how what I have to do. Um, if somebody's going to pay me three or four hundred bucks an hour, I'm going to go do that thing, and I'm going to do it at a high level. Hello, welcome to episode 169 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. When you really think about the amount of money real estate agents make or the time spent working each listing, it really is remarkable when compared to virtually every nine to five out there. Now I get it, you don't get paid on a consistent schedule and there is a ton of overhead to factor in. But our guest today says that by breaking down the amount of money earned by these hours spent securing that commission, it really helps foster a strong work ethic and drive to serve every client with world-class service. Breaking into the real estate industry in 2018, Scott Smith of Denver, Colorado says a focus on working with the clients nobody else in his brokerage wanted to is what led to a Rookie of the Year award. Fast forward to today and Scott is leading his own brokerage at U First Realty Infinity. Throughout our conversation, Scott shares why he believes there is no substitute for work ethic in real estate, why a long game approach to the business is so important, and what he looks for when hiring new agents. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the all new Smart Agents Magazine has launched and is full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you will find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Subscribe now to receive your copy of the printed magazine each month and instantly get access to our online agent community and members only templates. Click the link in the episode description or go to smartagents.com forward slash magazine. Also, if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, and of course, YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Scott Smith. In addition to his tips for finding success as a real estate agent, he shares how the concept of the virtual office has impacted his brokerage in all the right ways. The way I like to uh, start everything out is to have you introduce yourself to us a little bit, who you are and where you're at. Yeah, so I'm Scott Smith. I own U First Realty Infinity. It is a franchise of a larger brokerage. And I've been in, I'm in the Denver, Colorado area, really worked the whole I 25 corridor. So from Colorado Springs all the way to Fort Collins. And then I do about 25, 30% of my business in the mountains every year. So I try to stay as active as possible um, in as much of Colorado as possible so that I understand the market at a high level. And that way, when I have agents in different parts of the state, I can really be able to educate them and, and talk with them intelligently about kind of their market and what they have going on. I got into real estate initially. So I was a paratrooper back in the 90s, kind of bounced around, ended up doing some phone sales jobs, been doing sales for uh, 30 plus years. And in the early 2000s, I ran a small, got into mortgages, opened up my own mortgage company, ran a small mortgage company that did mortgages and small business financing. Like a lot of people in after 2008, 2009, I got out of financing because there was not a lot of financing, honestly. Um, bounced around to some corporate jobs. And in 2017, I was at a point in my life in my mid forties where I didn't have a college degree and everybody who wanted to hire, I, I had all of the qualifications to be a vice president, but nobody wanted to put me in that role because of a lack of a college degree, which meant that I was going to be constantly working for somebody else and made the decision that if I'm going to work for somebody, I'd rather work for myself. And I love real estate. And a friend of mine and I were talking, he's like, oh, he runs operations at our corporate. And he's like, oh, you really got to get back into real estate, Scott, it's something you know a lot about. Uh, so kind of crammed through real estate school in six weeks and got my real estate license to be ready for the summer selling season of 2018. And uh, yeah, never looked back. Glad I did it. Best decision I ever made. Right, right. And then, you know, obviously you had great success right out of the gate, winning Rookie of the Year. Tell me about that and what you did to uh, build up that business so quickly. Yeah. So interestingly enough, I 
I did all of my work off other people's notes. So um, I went to, first of all, the first thing I did before I ever even was done with real estate school is I went through all of my social media and I'm 50. So social media to me is Facebook, right? Like I don't do Snapchat or Instagram. I mean, I, I have those things now, but back then didn't really operate in those worlds. Uh, but I went through all of my Facebook friends that lived in Denver and I have kind of a move around past. So a lot of my connections are not in Denver, but I went through everybody I knew that, that lived in Denver and found out that one of my buddies wanted to buy a house and he was willing to wait until I got my license and be my first client. So I took a lot of pressure off of myself by having a client as soon as I was licensed and able to start showing that client. Um, and I, I think that's really important for new agents is you can find your first client before you even need your first client. And it takes all of that selling pressure off of you because a lot of agents, um, you know, they go six months a year in this business without closing a deal. And to me, that's like the worst thing you could ever possibly do. Like who wants to do a job for a year before you ever see a success. So I recommend going through your sphere and finding that first client through some connection, somebody you know, knows somebody who's gonna buy or sell. So do that right up front. Um, so I had that first deal in my pocket as soon as I got my license. And then I made sure everybody, I went through on Facebook and made sure that every single person I knew, knew that I was a real estate agent. There's 40,000 of us in Colorado, uh, 20,000 that are active and probably 5,000 that are really good. So everybody knows somebody here that's in real estate. And I made sure that everybody knew that this is what I did and they could trust me. And just because of my background, people know that, you know, I'm pretty intelligent when it comes to this subject. So it really gave me an in that um, maybe everybody doesn't have, but I was able to, to gather some clients that way. And then I went to the brokerage and I said, hey, look, are there clients that the brokerage has that other agents just don't want to work with? because either they're barely qualified or they're more tricky or they're more picky or, you know, there's got to be somebody out there. And so the brokerage was able to provide me with a list of people who other agents had just simply stopped working with and didn't want to deal with. And I turned a lot of those into deals. So I closed nine deals in my first nine months. I closed 17 deals in my first full year in real estate. And then I averaged over 30 deals a year since then. So um, it really does. I mean, I closed 22 deals this year and I'm running a brokerage full time. So, and a lot of that comes from referrals from those past, from past clients. So it's really important to get your name out there. It's really important to go to your leadership and say, Hey, look, I know that there are people that other people have given up on and I would like to work with them because I feel like I can turn some of those notes into yeses. And then keeping in touch and following up with your past clients. I would tell everybody the goal is to get to 100 clients. Once you've had 100 closings, your business starts to feed itself and you'll constantly have business as long as you're you're out there doing the right things. Right. Absolutely. I definitely want to touch on the, um, you know, the clients that other agents, you know, kind of backed away from uh, in just a moment. But first, going back to you know, setting up that first sale before you're in real estate, how did you, um, you know, get that messaging across and, and, you know, portray yourself out there as an agent prior to having your messaging to get people to trust you and to know that you're, you know, this is, you are the person that I should be working with once you do get that license. Yeah. So I, trust isn't built overnight. Um, what I will tell you is that the people I was reaching out to already trusted me because they've known me for long periods of time. That's the benefit of working with your sphere. I know I hear a lot of agents say, I don't want to work with friends and family because it's too complicated. Um, I would tell you you're doing it wrong. That should, a lot of the reasons that newer agents don't have that relationship with friends or family is that from their end, they don't treat that client the same way they would treat any other client. They take shortcuts. They don't provide them the same level of service. They assume that because that friend or family is a friend or family member that, you know, Uncle Carl's going to use them no matter what. And I think once that person starts to see you provide them a high level of service, and I would argue probably even a higher level of service that you would show a stranger, um, then they start to take you seriously. And that's that was the great thing about Jeff. 
is I started sending him homes before I was ever licensed. I started getting to know what he want, what he what he liked. Um, I we had a lot of conversations about what he wanted, where he wanted to be, and he knew that even though I was going to be newer in the industry, and I might even make mistakes, that he was willing to work with me because I was already bought into getting him what he wanted. And that I was going to go out of my way to make sure that at the end of the day, he got the best deal. Right. Absolutely. I really, I, you know, I think uh, what you said there about, you know, treating your friends and family, you know, with an even higher degree of service, I think is really smart and a, really a great way to start building up that uh, that referral business and that referral cycle pretty quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we all look, if you're in real estate, you're going to have somebody, you know, and love use somebody else. And it's very, very frustrating. And I get that. Um, but nobody owes us their business. We have to earn it every single day. And I had a, you know, I had a client a, about a year ago, a good friend of mine who um, he was going to use his cousin. And he said, Hey, I'd like you and my cousin to work together um, and then just split the deal. And I said, Hey, look, I'm, I'm just not willing to do that. I provide my clients with a high level of service. I know how that's going to look. I'm going to do all the work. I'm going to split the deal with your cousin. Um, and it's just not going to work out. If you want to use your cousin, you're more than welcome to. If you want to use me, I'm absolutely here for you. But then what I did was I continued to send him homes and I continued to engage with him about real estate. And then it became very obvious to him who the right person to use was. Because again, his cousin was just kind of assuming that he was going to go with her and never did any of the things required of a real estate agent to earn business. And I just kept being a great real estate agent. And at the end of the day, I helped him buy a home. And so I just, it is extremely important that if you want to earn people's business, that you do the things that are necessary to earn their business every single day. And if you drop the ball, be honest and be like, hey, you know what? You slipped my mind for a second, but I'm back in this thing and pick that ball up and run with it. And that's the great thing about real estate is you're going to drop balls all the time. They are very easily picked back up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Switching back to the uh, those clients within the brokerage yeah. that you know other agents just you know maybe had enough of, just didn't want to work with anymore, were kind of difficult. Um, you know, when you made contact with those clients, what was your message to those folks that maybe? I'd imagine some of them probably didn't have a great taste in their mouth with the last agents they worked with if things kind of fell apart. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just reached out to them and said, hey, you know, I know you've been looking to buy a house. I know it's been a little bit of a struggle, but um, I'm your guy and we're going to make this happen. I don't quit on anybody if you don't quit on me. And when you try to quit on me, I'm not going to let you. So let's yeah. get out and look at homes. And let's. And so I took them out and showed them homes, even though they weren't pre-qualified. Some of them needed credit work. Some of them needed income work. Um, but I built that relationship. And I know you will hear in this industry quite often, never show a client who's not pre-qualified. I would say that is the most foolish decision you can make. And I'm not telling you to go out and show somebody dozens of times who lives in their mom's basement and doesn't have a job. But I'm telling you that if somebody has a willingness to buy a house, get to know that person and get to know what, what their opportunities are and where their roadblocks are because even if somebody has bad credit that can be overcome in a much shorter time than you think with a good lender and somebody who understands credit repair and so you and also sometimes people get married and their income changes sometimes they get promoted and their income changes so really just getting that person to understand that you're going to be there for them and that you're in it for the long haul no matter how long it takes and then getting them out to see houses they love. I actually have a client who I never closed, uh, but referred me to people. And the reason he referred me to people who both closed is because I showed him when nobody else would, and he will eventually buy. He's just, you know, his credit, he has a 400 credit score and he earned it, right? So it takes, sometimes people have low credit and it's just a few small things. Sometimes people have low credit and they spend a lifetime earning that low credit and it takes much longer to fix. But you will get referrals from people who you treat well and who may never actually buy a house from. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, those are the people that, you know, when they do eventually, you know, when they're able to purchase that home, 
like you've just changed their life for generations. You know, like you, you've now made them, you've helped them achieve that American dream of owning a home. Like you are, you know, you're the greatest person that they've ever known. And absolutely, they're going to start referring you to everybody if they haven't already. And it's amazing. I mean, during the pandemic, things were really, I mean, everybody knows how competitive things were during the pandemic. Yeah. Who knew that a pandemic was going to set real estate on fire, right? right. Um, I had a client who over a few months period, I wrote 30 offers for. Um, they were barely able to qualify for a house, had no cash. Um, I will tell you that holiday weekends are great weekends to take folks like that out shopping because they're less competitive. Uh, we took them out. Of, I can't remember what holiday it was. We took them out over a holiday weekend. We're able to get them under contract on a great house. And, you know, people were like, wow, you wrote 30 offers for that person. Didn't that feel like a waste of time? And no, it does not feel like a waste of time. We get paid really well for what we do. Um, I look at if I'm if my activities are making over $100 an hour, I'm making more money than most people. And typically, if you look at the amount of time you put into a real estate deal, maybe you put in 24 hours in total on a complicated deal between showing and contracts and negotiations and all of that. Typically, it's around probably five or six, honestly. Um, but even if you put in 24 and you're making $15,000, ten thousand dollars you're making three four hundred bucks an hour and so i don't care where i have to drive i don't care how what i have to do um if somebody's going to pay me three or four hundred bucks an hour i'm going to go do that thing and i'm going to do it at a high level right was that a perspective that you had like right out of the gate when you came in yes. to real estate I, yeah because i i think that's one of those things that it would be I don't think I've ever had anybody break it down like that for me, you know, like the, how much you actually make in an hour. And when you really think about it, it is like, I'm making so much more money than 99% of the professions and the, the careers out there. My second deal was a $40,000 dog shit piece of little, I don't know if I can say that <laughs> piece of land that, uh, sorry, former paratrooper, but I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised that's the first time I've, I've cussed on this podcast, but um, I would have never told Jose to buy that piece of land. I would have talked him out of it. And maybe I think I made probably $1,500 when I closed. Um, but what what did I do for that $1,500? I took my daughter into the mountains, drove around the mountains for maybe two hours, um, had a great day with my daughter, had a fun time with Jose, came back down, spent maybe an hour you know, writing a contract because it was newer to me at that time and sat around for 45 days waiting for it to close. So I was probably in that deal for three hours. People were like, oh my gosh, why would you do all that work for a piece of land? And again, I'm like, who wouldn't do that? Like, I know people that work 10, 15, 20 days to make 1500 bucks. And I made it in basically less than three, you know, three, four hours. So of course I'm gonna do that deal. I would, I, I'm a very busy person and I would still do that deal today. And is that something, is that perspective when you are working with agents that you bring on to your team, is that something that you try to <laughs> instill in people and, you know, really get them to understand the the work? Yes, it is. And I will tell you, if you, that is an instinct that if you don't come with, it is very difficult to ensure. So uh, for instance, I did, when I was newer in the business, I did work with our, our in-house ISA team. And that ISA team, instead of making 75% of the commission, I made 40% of the commission. And I dealt with a lot of agents that said, Scott, I would never do that business for 40%, right? And the problem with their mindset is they're looking at it as an exchange of 75% to 40%. And that's not how I viewed it. I viewed it as I'm going to do all the business I can at 75%, and I'm going to do all the business I can at 40%. And I still get referrals to like, or people that come back to me today who were, who I closed at 40%, who now, because I own my own brokerage, I get paid a hundred percent on. Right. And so it wasn't an exchange of 75 for 40. It actually turned out to be an exchange for 40 plus a hundred. So if you, it is a very difficult mindset to teach. If you don't come that way, some people are very focused on like looking at a, looking at things in a small box. And I will tell you, things don't come in small boxes. You have to look at big picture stuff. What's, how's this going to play out over time? 
not how is this going to play out in this particular closing, because this is a units business. And the more units you do, the more money you make. And so I would much rather do 37 units than 12 units, because that's now 37 people that are going to refer me business that I'm going to go back to and that are going to buy and sell and buy again, that are, that are going to talk, you know, that give me reach across time that will allow me to grow my business. By having a mindset like that, does that, has that helped you in, you know, to push through and to, whether it was, you know, having to do all of the the showings or maybe it was sitting there for a few hours you know doing the cold calling when that's maybe not something you want to do but to push through and be determined to do all of those things that you know eventually will generate revenue yeah yeah absolutely i will tell you so i think it was 2020 so pandemic was 2020 right so Mm -hmm. in from january to june of 2020 i did a lot of work and for all of that work between January and June, I only did about $2 million worth of business, right? So very limited, put in a lot of work, was showing when everybody was like, I never took a day off during the pandemic, but I worked and I prospected. And so through June, I did about $2 million worth of business. From July until December, I did another $11 million worth of business. And it was all because of the work I did in those first six months. People think that this is a business where I make a phone call a day, it pays off tomorrow. That's not true. The work you do today pays off in 90 to 120 days typically. And so you have to be it, uh, you have to be able to kind of work for the future. And I don't remember who says it, but if they say, you know, look where you stumbled, not where you fell, it's a pretty famous quote. And if you look in real estate, if you're not doing business today, don't look at what you did yesterday. Look at what you did three months ago. And I almost promise you what you weren't doing is prospecting. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I think having that mindset, especially mm-hmm. early on in a real estate career is so good so that you don't get like so discouraged that you are ready to give up right before the floodgates are about to open. Yes, absolutely. Everybody's seen that meme where they're, you know, the guy's chop, chopping through the wall and the one guy's walking away with his ax and he's two inches away from diamonds. Right. I mean, that's literally the, the world we live in, which is why so many real estate agents fail because really two reasons, right? Number one, they come in and they're hot to begin with. And so because they think they know everything and then they quit prospecting and then they go cold and they think the business isn't for them. Or number two, they come in and they see people who are closing business and they feel like, well, they're not prospecting, so I don't need to prospect, but they don't see the five years that person spent prospecting before that, before they ever met them. And they don't do the work initially, feel like real estate isn't for them, and they get out of the business. Those are really why most real estate agents fail beyond lack of leads and lack of support. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you were gaining the success that you were, what was it that made you uh, decide to want to uh, start your own thing and, you know, kind of open up your own team? Um, That's all. I mean, I always knew that would be an eventuality, right? Like this is, um, I have been entrepreneurial for a very long time and it was just a natural progression. I would have gone out and started my own brokerage, but Brandon Christian, who, so it used to be Colorado Home Finder became me first. Brandon and I are very close. The opportunity he gave me for a franchise, they, corporate does a lot of my training. They they bring a lot of things to the table that I don't necessarily have to do. And, it, and it's time I don't have to use. And I love working with Brandon. He's, when it comes to money, he and I've never had a problem. He's very honest, very, he's a great guy. And so I like being, I like staying with him. And at the same time, I'm, you know, owning my own broker. So it's just really a win-win for all of us. Right. So now that, you, you know, now that you own your own brokerage, what are some of the key attributes that you look for in agents, you know, when you're bringing them on? Yeah. I mean, really it is about somebody who is hungry. I mean, that's the most important thing. I don't care if you have the skill. I care if you have the will, you know, again, I don't, I got lots of quotes that I don't know who said them, um, but you can't, I can teach you the game. I can't teach you the hustle. And so I look for people that, that want to hustle. Um, one of the probably mistakes I made as a new, as a new brokerage is I brought on part-time agents and part-time agents aren't really a great fit in this world, you know, and, 
it's good for the brokerage because occasionally they'll close a friend or family. But I'm really, my goal is really looking for people that want to do this full time. I don't care if you're brand new. I don't care if you've been doing it a while. It's, are you hungry enough to be able to grow and listen and are you coachable? Because if you're, if you're coachable and you're hungry, everything else is easy. Right. You mentioned earlier and, and you, you, you kind of alluded to this throughout our whole conversations that you're still actively out, you know, closing deals and, and working within your market. Um, how important do you think that is as a, you know, a broker owner to, to still be active in your market, to be able to pass on information to your agents? So I think there are levels to this thing. And I think if you have 100, 150 agents, that's impossible for you to be active. I have 13 agents. I think it's incredibly important that I'm still active. Um, I think once you get probably 30, 40 agents, your time just won't allow you to do it. Um, but I think when you've got 10, 15, 20 agents, it, it is very helpful for your agents to see you out there being active because it keeps you dialed into the market. So I think when it's possible, you should do it. I think for some broker owners, it's just not possible because there's the time isn't there and it becomes, you know, time is the most valuable thing we have. We're not getting any more of it. So you've really got to put it in the best place possible. Right. One of the things that, uh, you know, I wanted to talk to you about was the, the emergence of the virtual office and how that has, and first, you know, talk to you about how that has changed the real estate industry. Uh, and you know, what, uh, do you, are you guys fully virtual office? How do you guys, how's your business structured? Yeah. So prior to the pandemic, we were fully in the office. We would run monthly meetings, bi-monthly meetings, and we would get five, 10% of the office in because real estate agents don't like to come to an office. It's not really their their jam. And so once the pandemic hit, we started thinking of ways outside of the box as the leadership of the of the brokerage. And we began using GoToMe. And what we found was that we went from five or ten percent bi monthly to between twenty five and fifty percent every day. And so the virtual office is a no brainer. If you are, and we have a physical office, I'm not there today. I'm at my home office, but we have a physical office. Corporate has a physical office and some agents go there. They're, you know, I'm an office rat. I like to be in the office, but most agents don't. But what you'll find is those agents will take the time to listen while they drive to a showing or driving the kids to school or they'll dial in in their pajamas because they woke up, you know, at 8.30 and nine o'clock in the morning and you get much more interaction and then you start to get people contributing in different ways we also do a lot of prospecting workshops that way where everybody dials into a go to meeting and you end up with a lot more activity because these people are now on a call accountable to other people talking about the activity you know every 30 40 minutes and so it really does allow the brokerage to have a little bit more control and sight over agents where if you're just depending on them to come into the office. Most agents you'll never see. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's interesting. Our um, our office. We actually pan, when the pandemic hit, we you know went to the virtual thing, and then eventually just stayed virtual. And it was really interesting how you know everybody that was based out of Jacksonville. It was a small percentage of the company, and we were all tight and talked regularly. But then the rest of the company, we didn't have a, much of a relationship with. Once we all went virtual, it really kind of everybody closed in and really started interacting with each other, you know, across, you know, across, comp, uh, you know, across departments and everywhere else. No, you're exactly right. I mean, it, it changes the game. I think it's I'm surprised we didn't do it earlier. And I don't know if you guys did, but we shrunk the size of we went from a 20,000 square foot office to like a 4,000 square foot office with the same number of agents. And again, you get five, 10 agents a day that go into the office, but we interact with like 40, 50 agents a day virtually, which like you said, I mean, it just, it makes the world better because the more people you see, the more people get to know each other. It just, it elevates everything. Yeah. And like you said, you have more people calling into those meetings. So have you found a lot more collaboration, you know, with ideas Absolutely. and with, you know, with different all across all aspects of the business? Absolutely. And Cody, who runs kind of, he's our operations manager, but he does a lot of stuff. Um, he runs a lot of independent meetings. So we do, a, we, we do 
9 a.m. meetings kind of morningly, but um, he also does like a couple of meetings a week where it's like two, three o'clock in the afternoon that ties into a prospecting workshop, talking about just all different aspects of the industry, making sure that people are really dialed into what's going on today, which is why I think we've been ahead of the game with a lot of clauses and a lot of tricks to get people under contract throughout uh, the different markets we've had in the last few years. I think it it really keeps you on the edge and you got to make sure that your agents know what's working and what isn't because it can be the difference between, you know, them closing a deal and not closing a deal, understanding how to how to, you know, write a contract in the current market and how it's different than it was last month. Yeah. And I think, you know, having that collaboration between agents kind of helps form that bond and you know, having agents that you can lean on, whether they're, you know, in your network or just whoever it is that you can, you know, kind of build that business relationship with is definitely going to help you get through any type of little stumble that you might come across. Yeah, no, absolutely. A hundred percent. And we'll have meetings about specific topics when the interest rates went up. I mean, we, we got on and said, Hey, look, here's, here's what's going on with interest rates. Let's talk about it. Let's hash it out. Let's come up with some things that we can talk to clients about um you know that will help you get them through this momentary lapse of them maybe wanting to buy because interest rates are higher and we start talking about you know the cost of waiting and you know marrying the house dating the rate things you hear regularly but newer agents would have never heard before agents who only close a few deals a year might be out of the loop so it's good to get get everybody on the same page and make sure that people fully understand um, how to manipulate through uh, a more difficult market than it's been in a few years. Right. Absolutely. The other side of the virtual office I wanted to talk to you about was when it comes to the actual homes that you are either listing for clients or, you know, showing to potential buyers and how has, you know, that aspect of life changed how you are marketing a home or, you know, showing the attributes of that property. So I video a lot of homes for clients one of the things that I tell my clients is, hey, let, let me be your legs because there may be 15 homes they want to see. And we know that pictures are professionally taken, right? Like you can catfish the hell out of the house. <laughs> yeah. And so I will tell people, look, shoot me the houses that, that are questionable and I'll go take video of them. Um, and then it'll pull the cloak, it'll pull the coverage back off. The other thing that allows me to do is now I have video of three or four houses. And I can send that out to clients and because when I'm when I'm walking through and talking about a house, I'm never talk, very rarely am I like, hey, Carl, I think this kitchen is great for you. I'm talking about the house in a very generic way. That way I can use that video when I get back to the office and send it out to a few clients who that house may be applicable for or at least in the ballpark of. Because one thing is, is when people think you're working for them and you're, you're working for them at a time when they're working and not able to work for themselves, that again, helps build that trust, helps build the relationship. And it's really easy to tell somebody, hey, look, I was in a house today. I thought this was a great house for you. Really, this kitchen looked amazing and it's kind of exactly what you're looking for. I'm not sure if the area is right. And they're like, oh my gosh, Scott was in a house and thought of me and sent me this picture. Now, all of a sudden, um, I'm their agent, If even if I'm not actually their agent. Yeah, I like that idea of, of actually, you know, you might be doing uh, something for one specific client, but, you know, having that, you know, the the videos or whatever to be able to send out to whoever. So it really does look like you're always working for each individual client. Absolutely. And you got to find ways to separate yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um so we are at the time of recording this, we're coming up at the end of uh, the year here. What uh, what's, so, you know, the future looking like uh, for your team and, you know, kind of going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it looks good. Everybody's got people in the car right now. Um, everybody's also had some people who this time of year gets tough. I, I, I tell you that it's probably a 10 to 1 call ratio for the summer, right? And that's something we talk about is in the summer, you might have to make three calls. Right now, you got to make 30 because people are starting to plan for Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving comes Christmas and a lot of agents back off and they think, oh, okay, there's, I'm going to do less activity right now because there's less opportunity. 
And you need to be doing the exact opposite right now. You need to be doing three, 10 times the amount of activity because you still want to be able to close business in no, in November, in December, in January, in February. If you look in real estate, January is a closing desert for a lot of people. Like January sinks a lot of agents. Um, and then things start to turn around kind of mid-February, March. But if you're doing the prospecting now, you'll get deals under contract in December. You'll have closings in January. And you've got to make sure you're set up for at least a closing or two in January because otherwise it gets really, really tough. Yeah, absolutely. Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us and, uh, you know, share, you know, how you've built your business and the, the you know, the way uh, you're training, your, you know, your agents and, uh, you know, getting them success. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on, Michael. Uh, you have a great podcast and, you know, you have the opportunity to bring a lot of people on. And I just say thanks for uh, making me that guy. I want to thank Scott for joining us today and can easily see why he found such sustainable success. I'm a big believer in serving every client with world-class service, but going even an extra mile for those friends and family that choose to do business with you. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.